Hello there, everybody, and welcome to the Talking City podcast brought to you by the Manchester Evening News. My name is Dan Murphy, and joining me today, as ever, is Mr. Simon Bukowski. Si, how's it going? Yeah, I'm all right. I've had to shut all my curtains, though. It's too sunny. <laughs> is that, has that had a massive effect on your mood, or are you still okay? Wait, you know, I mean, it... Bit of shade, and now you just crumpled into a sad all little been, ball. You've all been waiting for me for like 10 minutes, so I had to get perfect lighting. No, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Well, to be fair though, it's very nice for you to go with the perfect lighting because if people want to watch this in living colour, they can go over onto YouTube and watch it on Manchester Evening News dash Man City. But I'll no doubt plug that again later before we get to all that side. It was a busy old weekend for Manchester City and quite a good one compared to um, the week that preceded it. But before we get into the match itself, the win over Aston Villa before and during that game, City fans certainly made their voices heard following uh, the news on last on Monday, a week ago now, of the Premier League's charges against City. Um, an array of banners, uh, chanting and you know, a whole manner of kind of defiance was certainly heard from the Etihad, from City supporters. Uh, what what was that kind of atmosphere like, and you know, what what's the general feeling you got um, around the place? Yeah, defiance is a good word. Um, it was it was PG rowdy, word. and it it wasn't particularly friendly. Um, and City fans, you know, made their feelings clear with you know the the usual humour, but also anger, really. Um, you know, the the one of the supporters uh, groups had decided to sort of welcome the the team bus uh, into the stadium, and you know, fans were gathered outside. Uh, you know, an hour and a half before kickoff, singing and um, making their feelings known. And you had, you know, cities going down with a billion in the bank and and that kind of stuff, and then um, saying, you know, not not too complimentary things about the Premier League. Um, and that, you know, then corresponded to, to the atmosphere inside the ground, um, which had all the same, also had huge booing of the Premier League anthem, which, I mean, I'll be honest, I didn't even know the Premier League had an anthem until... <laughs> the iconic tune drowned out by the Well, yeah, exactly. It's not quite the same as the Champions League anthem, is it? But, um, yeah, it was, uh, it wasn't very nice. And, you know, they had a... <laughs> Two banners, which you've probably all seen by now, but yeah, the that one, one that one got through the the stag do haze. I managed to get <laughs> see that one crack through my uh, my di- my weekend off. I must say the uh, the doctor one, yeah, not I the mean, lawyer one. I should the, say the lawyer one, yeah. Um, panic on the the streets of London, a, a reference to Lord Panic, who has been hired by Manchester City. It's um, a sign of modern football, I think, when there's. Uh, a, a banner to to a lawyer but you had that which was sort of you know quite tongue-in-cheek and then you had uh a few lads who just printed out a a middle finger uh and said investigate that which you know for, for simplicity i think that's maybe the winner um but the whole the whole afternoon felt like the club were holding up a middle finger to the premier league um and obviously you had the team winning three three one uh one of the best sort of certainly first halves of football uh they've played in a long 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 mm. time and um and at the end uh you had the the stadium dj playing panic by the smiths which again uh Brown synergia. nice little nod to say yes we know what's going on and we will not go quietly it almost seems like charges actually aside that it couldn't have Guardiola must be absolutely buzzing not was it a month ago at this point three weeks that he was bemoaning the lack of atmosphere and um, you know everyone being quiet at the Etihad um, and now all it's taken is 100 plus Premier League charges and he's got the atmosphere he's always wanted and it seems to me now it feels like Guardiola almost like he's a kind of old bitter enemy in Spain Mourinho he really could build a siege mentality around this now a real kind of um us against the world sort of feeling. The fans are already on that quite clearly as it is. And maybe this could be like the, the spark and the kind of fireworks up the up the jacket that City needed to really kickstart the season and kind of get things going again. And it, it seems to have a, quite an impact in the match. Yeah, he must wish, must wish he could get 100 charges against him every year. <laughs> it's... Um... It, it was quite something, um, you know. It was it was anything but happy flowers on 
on on Sunday. It was um, there was a real edge to it, and and what Guardiola did on Friday um, is not only kind of unite the fan base behind this idea of innocence, because it's one thing, you know, a club statement saying in legalese that we're safe in our position. It's quite another for the manager who fans look up to um, and see speaking every few days to say. We we are innocent. We will be proven innocent. Um, so the, there was that aspect to it. But then also, you know, all week it had been the Premier League, the Premier League, the Premier League. And Guardiola turned it onto the clubs and said, you know, it's these 19 behind uh, the Premier League, uh, which, you know, founded or not, like you say, has given City a real emphasis to go out and um, rub, well rub all the clubs up the wrong way like they feel like they've been been treated as well so it, it's not like melodramatic enough to be enemies or anything like that but it's saying right well if, if you if you want to make life tough for us we're going to make life tough for each and every single one of you 19 and the premier league and uh, we'll see who comes out on top like I'm not going to kind of be a, um, a hypocritical on the lawyer front because I remember when Bolton, I mean, our lawyer was saving the club's life, so maybe a bit of a difference. But when our lawyer, I think she had an awesome name, it was like Thunderstone or something awesome like that. Like we were all supporting her and all that stuff. So I, I don't kind of blame City fans for being, as I said, defiant and backing their club and stuff. But kind of from a neutral point of view or maybe a devil's advocate point of view, it seems, you know, it, I, I, I don't, I, it, it's not a conspiracy theory, I don't think, and maybe that sort of, opinion has been branded in certain certain corners online. I don't think anyone's I mean, again, just from like my personal and uh, neutral point of view no one's out to get City personally, I don't think. Maybe you may disagree, or City fans may disagree clearly, but it's not like they're out personally out to get them or it's a, a vendetta against City just because maybe they're the new, you know relatively speaking, newest boys on the block and whatnot. The charges, I don't think the charges that have been laid are just Oh, well, let's get City, and you know we don't like them. Blah, blah blah. If any other club had been, you know, had reason to have be investigated against and had these charges against, I don't think it's just because of who City are that the charges have come. It could have happened to any club. It's just, you know, City are the ones who have been investigated and deemed worthy to be charged. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it seems a bit. So it seems a bit strange. The, the the level of kind of protest against it, I suppose, and the vitriol aimed at the Premier League, and it's the same with the Champions League. Like I can understand. Why you'd want to be defiant, but what is every every city match from ever now apart from the Carabao Cup going to start with rousing booze to every anthem and whatnot? I don't know. It's strange. what do you think? I don't, I, I, I don't know if I've explained myself pretty well there, but I, I think I know where you might no, no, where I, coming from. I, I, I think you. Um, I think it's absolutely fair, but I, I also think it's sort of um, you know that there aren't many truths in football. There are just different accounts from different sides. And everyone's out for their own thing. And, and I think, you know, those who fully believe that City will get found guilty either, you know, look at the fact that UEFA have charged them and the Premier League have charged them and think, oh, there's no smoke without fire. And, you know, the, the football leaks um, stuff that started all this, um, which, which is, you know, completely fair enough. But, but also, I think you've got to see that everyone is out for themselves in football and UEFA have their own motives and motivations and the Premier League have their own motives and motivations and you know um you know, the football finance expert Kieran Maguire tweeted when the charges were came like you know what a what a coincidence this has happened just as the the government's white paper was set to be published um which you know would have not been in favor of the Premier League regulating itself um and, you know, there have long been uh, criticisms of the Premier League for bowing to sort of the, the big six um, against the other 14 and going where where the money is and where the power is. Um, and I think, you know, it, the Premier League can't really be seen as like this impartial arbiter uh, because they have their own motivations and, and reasons for doing things as well. Um, and from... You know, if if proven, then the charges will go beyond financial fair play. But financial fair play is a big part of this. And I don't think it's, you know, a conspiracy theory to say that um, 
financial fair play was kind of built to mm-hmm. secure the existing hierarchy, which, which City were not part of. And, you know, like Guardiola says, when he was at Bayern Munich, people were slagging City off for their finances. Um, so this has been around for a long, long time. And City fans have had to put up with mm. 10 years longer of people saying, you cheats, you cheats. So they can respond any way they like, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it, we it, said, "Oh, go." On. No, no. After you, I think I was going to say. I think we said last week when we was delving into this in in depth, like the the kind of the premise of financial fair play itself. Like I think, as we said, it's been around for ten years now. What fifteen years? Still doesn't make that much sense. I don't think anyone's really fully grasped why some clubs can do what they want. You look at Barcelona basically going bankrupt still you know still spending millions on players Chelsea can just get a new owner and spend 600 million in a year why can't City do similar when City other than Jack Grealish which is what two years ago under over 10 years of ownership have never they've spent lots of money and they spent more money than most others but they've never gone to absolutely ludicrous lengths in a, a year or it's now I don't think it's ever been quite maybe the one season when they got as, as we said 130 million on fullbacks other than that it's never really been obscene spending or kind of rid- to a ridiculous level I, don't know, I think it's kind of still quite hard for some to grasp why City what City are doing is bad compared to when you look at other clubs what they're doing and they can get away with it it's, yeah, it's, it's, and, it's a and strange you, old scenario and you've also got the ownership model whereby mm. you know City have been accused of um, you know disguising sponsorship money by mm. the, the their ownership putting putting yeah. money in themselves and you know they they're real breaches but they're also an owner putting money into their club you know, why what, can't they just spend their own money like the, i don't the, i don't get it yeah the, there's a club over at old trafford who would dearly love if their owners decided to put money into the club rather than taking it out hmm. um so you know th- this is not to say that the the charges are a nonsense or anything like that because we'll have to wait to see what the what the commission says, but it, it opens up various can cans of worms mm. um, about, you know, ownership at the highest level, the Premier League and its role um, and its influences and who it is influenced by, um, mm-hmm. a, as well as all the debate around Manchester City. So it, it's huge about City, but it goes well beyond City as well. Um, which is why it, it's such a big deal, but also why it's just so so difficult to you know to get to the bottom of what's actually happening and and why mm-hmm. because like I say, everyone's got their own motivations and also kind of like you know not related at all. But you sort of see um, this weekend has not been good for the Premier League, has it? You've had um, you know uh, the the chanting at, at Ellen Road. Um, you've had Arsenal fans putting up a banner saying we're classy, we don't have oil money, and then Arsenal fans two hours later racially abusing Ivan Tony. Um, so that there's not, it's not like it's a pure Premier League and City are the one blot in stopping the uh, the, the glorious image. Um, that there's a lot of things in the Premier League that are not. Um, not good, basically, um, mm-hmm. and obviously, misleading finances is one of them. But um, I think, yeah, City fans would say, "Why are we being singled out when th- there's lots of bad things going on?" Probably. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, there was what at least some good things for City, and that was a kind of a return to winning ways. And as you said, there a real good performance. I, I I was dying in an airport when this game was on, so I didn't get to watch it in person. But I've just kind of caught the highlights this morning, and it, it seemed like a a new life was breathed breathed into the into the side. I don't think they've looked that that sharp, that um, alive, that kind of um, really just 
going forward, just one touch move. I think we said this last week, didn't we? After the uh, after the Tottenham defeat, the, the there was like no one touch passing, one one touch movements in those matches against um, Aston Villa. That that looked back. Haaland finally getting in behind um, and causing damage. And uh, by half time, it was over. So for City won three one. They raced into a three nil um, lead. Rodri opening the scoring. Um, Haaland teed up Gundogan for the second before Mares uh, converted a penalty. For the third, um, Ollie Watkins got a consolation in the second half, but otherwise, um, as I say, a galvanising atmosphere for City um, and a galvanising kind of performance on the pitch to reflect that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, only sort of slightly spoiled by Pep afterwards saying that the second half was much better than the first, which sort of, you know, Pep, Pep gone a Pep kind of thing. It's, um, yeah, it, it was a a comprehensive first half and uh, they scored three. They could have had two, three more. Um, it just looked like they were all over Villa. Um, and and then in the second half was okay. They slackened off a bit. Villa scored. The crowd got back up and were like, come on. Uh, they had a bit of a reaction. Villa still kept coming. Edison did very well, which, um, you know, Edison's been getting dogs abuse from some supporters for probably like a month or so now uh, for for very little reason. Um, and, you know, it's, well, it's largely because he doesn't have much to do other than see shots fly past him. And I don't think he was great for Watkins' goal, but then he was finally given some goalkeeping to do um, and he did it very well. So it, it was an afternoon full of positives, really. Um, you know, that Haaland going off at half time was was a bit of a concern, but I don't think um, that is too serious um, ahead of Arsenal. So, you know, it was it, it was an afternoon like we've you know not been used to to seeing mm. recently. It wouldn't. Well, I'm saying like it, it seems like it's the most comfortable City win for some time. Like, I know they yeah. beat Wolves yeah, pretty handily. Yeah. Yeah, they they beat Wolves pretty handily recently. But they, they? But, but they beat Wolves three 0 But it took them forty minutes exactly. to score, and it wasn't a great sort of first half. Whereas, you know, this is the first time they've scored in the first ten minutes of a game since they beat United six three in October. First time they've scored from a set piece in a long, long time um, in the league since before the World Cup. So, it's um, it, it, there were a number of things where you thought, yeah, that is what City were good at doing that they've not been doing for the last few mm -hmm. months. And it wasn't even as if it was the kind of a back to basics approach that I was certainly preaching last week. It was, if anything, more complicated when that team when that team sheet came out. Um, I see I've seen your tweets and posts having been left in utter confusion. But from what I've kind of gathered, it was basically City didn't play a left back in the strictest sense, but Bernardo Silva was just given the instruction of uh, be everywhere, everywhere, and every time, all at once, or whatever the name of that film is. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know, Guardiola finally gave the fans Laporte and Diaz that they wanted, but in, in typical fashion, not in the way that anyone was expecting. <laughs> the monkey paw, the monkey paw curls with Pep. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. It was, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it was, it was pretty much as they've been playing for weeks in that it was like a back three in possession, going back to a back four, um, went out of possession, but Bernardo was kind of the one chosen to be the, fullback slash mid midfielder um which is obviously different to a fullback but by doing that it means you get better build up because um your you know your roaming player is a player with bernardo's quality and you also have better build up with uh, laporte being in the team so it it just looked more like I say more fluid more pacey um you know i'm not sure they will do that for for arsenal um, because, you know, there's the threat of, of Saka, who, you know, Ake did really, really well against in the in the cup game. Um, so I, I think City will probably go back to that for for Arsenal. But it's an option against um, teams at home who otherwise might be difficult to break down. And it's an option where, you know, you've not got a winger that you, you're worried about, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it seems... Um... 
a strange one for Bernardo. Like he's played every single position, literally now going into the left back. Did he actually have to do much defensive sort of work? I know he, he kind of had Grealish in front of him, I believe, as well, who's, if anything, has been getting plaudits for his kind of backtracking in recent weeks. Um, how, how did he actually work in a, in a defensive sense? Like, I, I pitched it more, he would be in the midfield and go to, but without the ball, it might be Laporte goes out to left back and Rodri comes in and he goes into more defensive midfield position. Like how, how did it kind of like kind of work out when without the ball? Yeah, he was pushing forward a lot into, into midfield. And I, I mean, he is another position for him, but he's, he's also kind of used to that. He's, he's used to dropping as deep as the centre backs to get the ball anyway. So it, it wasn't, too much of a stretch for someone who is such an intelligent footballer. Um, yeah, and and Villa offered very little in the first half, so there wasn't too much to get, um, you know, wor- worried by, I would say. Um, yeah, they, they didn't really get down that side, so Bernardo had had time and space, which is, you know, exactly what City would have would have wanted when, when when they decided on to go with that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How how um how was the performance in like kind of general? Like, did the team do you see this team other than the kind of left back thing being what he kind of settles on going forward now? Like you say, it seems like since that it's the first really comprehensive, no stress display since that United win, which we've often said that was probably the last time. That, you know those two wins back to back, wasn't it? United and Southampton back to back. They scored ten goals in two games. It feels like since them them two games, I think they lost to Liverpool after the Southampton match, didn't they? It feels like them them two matches are the last time they played really really well and looked like themselves. And it's been kind of a few months of don't worry, they've had good moments. They've won most of the games, but it's definitely felt like a few months of kind of being lost in the weeds a sort of bit. And now maybe they finally cleared out. Could Guardiola kind of has always. S- especially in defence, he kind of settles on the players. If they play well, he doesn't drop them sort of thing. Is is that what's going to happen here? Obviously, there's going to be rotation here and thereabouts. There's Champions League games coming up and whatnot. And obviously, a big match on Wednesday. But part of the guy, you know, in general, is this going to be his strongest team going forward? Yeah, I think certainly plenty of fans would like that 11 to be more or less the, the strongest 11 um city have got i think you know he, he took diaz off at half time um after diaz got a he got booked for one of those strange things that we saw over the weekend about him being like the third one to approach the referee um and so uh pep said oh it took him off because he was on a yellow card which suggests that he wants him at least for arsenal and you know we'll use him more in the future he spoke pretty much about needing his leadership so um, I think we will see more of Diaz. He spoke glowingly about Kyle Walker after the after the game, um, and yeah, I mean, De Bruyne had his best match in a long time. Ilkay Gundogan looked very, very sharp. Bernardo Rod- Rodri was a different player from the one that sort of stank out the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, um, and that resulted in more service to Haaland than he's had for a good while. So, um, I, I, you know. It, it, it's hard to say this will be the the eleven or the system. I think the system will have tweaks, but it, for too long, too many players have been out of form, and there were signs on the pitch that um, players were coming back into form. And Guardiola said afterwards that like he's noticed a difference in in training in the last seven days, which would suggest an upturn mm. as well. Well, it's certainly the the best timing for that to be as well. I mean, I think you've said a few a few weeks now, like this could be the turning point, this could be the turning point, and it's kind of not been. They've been fits and starts, but I feel like this m- match generally does feel like this could be the point where right, it's finally clicking again. And now, if they can go on a run now, it's going to be quite uh, dangerous for Arsenal, as we'll touch on soon. But like I say Haaland, his his assist I thought was absolutely excellent because he goes through and I'm like oh my it was like seeing a, um, a cage animal finally freed he's like finally got in behind the defence I've not seen it in weeks and instead of shooting I was like what what's he done there he didn't how is he not shot at that I mean it would have it would have sailed in but he didn't and he, he his, assist, his assist was almost like a shot the way he dragged the ball across across the face of goal but it was an excellent pass and it, I say he didn't actually score in this match, and he was off at half time. But it felt like that's the Erling Haaland that we've seen score twenty goals in about twelve games at the start of the season, and who 
in the second half of the season has looked cut and isolated, a forlorn figure at times, a bit of a frustrated figure. He looked back to the Haaland that was taking the world by storm just a few short months ago. Yeah, there was a bit earlier in the first half when he um, he got put through sort of for an aerial challenge with Martinez and, and Martinez, um, they clattered into each other. I'm not sure if that was actually the the injury that ended up taking him off. It, like Martinez's knee went into his thigh um, and he needed a bit of a bit of treatment afterwards for, for that. But even that, just like smashing into a goalkeeper for a high ball, you could see like the, the smile on his face. Um, and then, like you say, that assist, it was just incredible pace. And then he, he turns and you think, why aren't you shooting? Um, and you think the moment's lost. And then he, you know, a, a trademark City goalie smashes it across the six-yard box and someone comes in at the at the back post. So, um, yeah, you know, the, there was a lot of overreaction um, around Haaland and his place in the team and at the club um last last week after the Spurs defeat and you know I think uh, and you know so much made of oh he's just a goal scorer you, you lose out with with him on the pitch and and whatever so you know I'm, I'm sure he'd have wanted to score for, but for him to get an assist was probably the best the best response to all of that and and yeah you know De Bruyne looked different looked sharper than than he's been for a while and and that probably helped but you know the whole team did but Haaland certainly looked to have that extra zip um that he he has not always had um since the world cup mm-hmm. and yeah we can we can only hope it's his injury it isn't a serious one it was just precautionary and he is available for wednesday's block bluster cash out uh, clash it's finally here Si. the match we've been waiting for for some time now some weeks you know city will face arsenal and you know, I think you were the one saying that it could all change very quickly, but I don't think any of us thought that the, um, at the point a few weeks ago that if City had actually win the game, they would move level. Actually, they'd move above Arsenal, even though the Gunners still have um, would still have a match to play. This is like humongous. I think I think a lot of people were thinking that if City kind of win this year, then the title is. You think they're back in? You know, the, the momentum's back in their favour. They would probably go back to being favourites, and I think. As we said last week, you know, Arsenal, they lost their first match for some months against Everton. And I, I think I was saying, like, I didn't like their reaction. I think even Zinchenko, the most experienced winner on that pitch, if even he's seeing his, uh, seeing his rear end a little bit and shouting at people and getting uh, biting at Neil Mopé's antics, then their heads aren't right. They, they, they could well have a bit of a wobble. And then Brentford, not the best opponents to have next. And they drop more points, which, as we say, has set up this match on Wednesday perfectly. Yeah, and, and also to make the point, um, you know, we've talked about Guardiola struggling for a a moment to, to bring everything together and the Premier League giving him one, you know, for the team to come together. Like, you know, they, they came together against Aston Villa, but it's straight after these these allegations. Um, you know, what what a moment for the Premier League if their actions in charging City in the middle of the season when there's no reason to, you know, wait till the end of the season, like while football is going on. If their actions kind of directly or indirectly contribute towards the team that they've slapped 100 charges against um, winning another Premier League title, you know, I think the uh, I think it'd be nice to see the uh, the reaction between the players when Richard Masters is trying to give them the medals and and whatnot but you know that is still a long long way away but City beat Arsenal in the FA Cup and a lot of people said well that was great for Arsenal because they played a weakened team and they uh, only came away with a 1-0 defeat and they could have won the game so fantastic for them they've not lost anything well they've not won since that game and you know you it, called it you called I, it I called it and I, and I can say, say that I called it and it might have made zero difference you know, it might just be a coincidence, but I'm claiming it. But, you know, they lost to Everton and then it was consecutive defeats and they've then drawn against Brentford and now it's they've not won in three. And, you know, if City beat them on Wednesday, all the pressure, all the talk will be on City of favourites now. City of favourites now. And, and you know, they've it's not 
often that it's been said that Arsenal were favourites while they've been top of the league. But the last few weeks and maybe a month, that has turned. Since so... they beat United, I think that everyone yeah. went favourites, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. So so there's a lot of pressure on on Arsenal. And, and for City, they can sort of say, you know, go out and upset another rival and uh, and upset the Premier League some more. So it, it's going to be a really difficult game. City haven't been great this season um, away at the top teams. Obviously, they've lost at Liverpool, United, Spurs, um, beat Chelsea, but are Chelsea a top team anymore? I don't know. Um, but... Yeah, it's been it's been difficult for them, and they've also struggled to get Haaland involved away from home, kind of a lot more. So it's going to be, yeah, a, a real challenge. But it's suddenly looking a lot rosier for City than it was, you know, one two weeks ago. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as as we're saying, I don't think any of us expected it to be. You know, the couple of days, a day before the game, thinking City could actually go above Arsenal if they won. It'd only be goal difference, and Arsenal do have a game in hand, which coincidentally is against Everton, who beat them, and that's going to be played on first of March. So they've still got three games to go, including City, before they are a level on matches. But, but it's also, a big one. City still have to play Arsenal. Mm-hmm, so if City exactly. beats Arsenal, even with that game in hand, yep, it's in Since City's hands. hands again. It is. It is, and um, as we've just said, if they can go on the run now. Which it kind of feels like the prime to do. Maybe, you know, maybe it'll, you know, say it's a massive game. Arsenal are quality. And even though they did lose that match, as you did say, they could have won it and they are going to be more at full strength. It could go either way. I think, you know, they're, they're going to be up for it just as much. It's going to be so important for them. And it has all the makings of an absolutely classic tie. And it's really interesting as well because we spoke after the FA Cup game and said Arsenal have strengthened in this window, City have weakened. Mm. And like, look how well Trossard's done. Yeah. But now, ahead of this game, you've got people saying, you know, well, Trossard should be in for Martinelli. Why is he picking Martinelli still? <laughs> and suddenly this team that has been so consistent, you know, consistent, I think he's picked Martinelli and Saka in like every league game. Mm. Suddenly, you've got his team and his decisions being questioned. Yeah. discontent. Because of the extra competition that mm. he's brought in. So... You know, it, it's a minor point. It's not going to make much difference, but it's um, it's just a, a sign how sometimes oh. things can work out funny. But also, you know, having said, oh, I said that after the FA Cup game. I also said this week, last week, after the Spurs game, you, you know, Walker said, oh, I know we're a team that can go on a big run. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we'll see because they've only won one game in... One game, they've not won any games in a row. They just no. beat them Villa. Um, but like I say, the atmosphere feels completely different now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think you're right. What people were you saying about the Arsenal squad? I think a lot of Arsenal fans were quite angry after the transfer window, weren't they? I believe there's Edu out hashtag trending and whatnot. I don't know if they if those fans are reflective of like kind of actual fans who go to their games and whatnot and you know not to disparage people who can't go to games they're not their fans but you know what I mean there's certain certain corners of internet for every every fan base that might not be reflective of the general consensus but um I thought they did really well in signing players who won't be not going to be bothered if they're not first team straight away and if they had got Mudrick and spent 80 million on him How's he not starting? So it, it felt like, oh, they've actually done the right thing. They've done well to miss out. But now if it's happening anyway, maybe they should Maybe they should have gone out all out for Mudrick. But, you know, we go into this game. Do, what changes do you see any City making? And will one be enforced? Like, if Haaland can't play, is it as simple as putting Alvarez in for him? Or, or does he kind of uh, make some tinkers elsewhere? I, I think it is as simple as Alvarez coming in for Haaland. But at the same time, you know, Haaland was involved in training yesterday. so. We'll get an update from from Guardiola today at the press conference, but I, I would expect Haaland to be involved. Um, I think Nathan Ake would start at left back um, against against Saka. We might see Akanji or Lewis come back into the team, um, but other than that, you know, I think he goes Mara's Grealish Haaland again. I think he probably goes Rodri, De Bruyne, and Gundogan again. Um, you know, Bernardo has played very well. 
but that that is not a bad a bad decision to have to make but because the players are in form you know it, it's it's no longer like oh well who might play better than they have done it in weeks it's like who can follow up sunday's performance um and and then yeah and then kind of you know you've got the option of of alvarez foden and whoever doesn't play out of that midfield uh trio on, on the bench to to come on and, and make a difference so i think um i mean it's always a strong team but I, i'd be surprised if it was a really strange team um on wednesday i think we're, we're back in the in the world of more conventional and can i before your voice completely dies can i get a can i, <laughs> can I get a score prediction out of you can you no, manage it i i was fine when i started i don't know what's gone on um yeah i <laughs> Uh I'll go for one nil city just to put the cat among the pigeons. Well, I'll go uh, for one one. I think I think it's gonna keep finally poised, but it'll be very fun to see. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be able to follow all the build up action and reaction to Wednesday's game over on Manchester Evening News uk forward slash Manchester City. Simon, Joe, and myself, and no doubt all the rest of our great colleagues will be bringing all the expert analysis and news from the game. It's set to be an absolute um dinger, so we cannot wait to uh, to watch it unfold. We'll be back later on this week to um, pick it apart, analyse it, and hopefully we'll have plenty to talk about. About. But until until later on this week, thank you everyone very much for listening. If you want to watch this podcast in living colour, you can go over to our YouTube channel, as I say, Manchester Evening News dash Man City. But until later on this week, everyone, it's goodbye for now. Ta-ra.